All right. For those of you who do not know me, I am Pastor Arthur. I am the lead pastor here at Love of Christ Fellowship Church in the city of San Diego. And super excited to have you with us this morning. Uh, As a part of our family Sunday, I wanted to deviate from our uh, series on the book of Philippians. And so this morning, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter number 8. The book of Mark, chapter number 8. We're going to talk about the cost of discipleship. The book of Mark chapter number 8. I was going to start at verse 34, but I actually think I'm going to start at verse 31. Yeah, I'm going to start at verse 31, and then we'll go through to 35. The book of Mark, chapter number 1. I'm sorry, book of Mark, chapter number 8. We're going to begin reading at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things, concerns of God. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. The cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this day and for the opportunity you give us. Uh, to draw near to you by study of your word. We pray, Lord, that your word would be illuminated in our hearts this morning, that you would give us clear understanding, clear instruction, Lord, from heaven. God, we humble ourselves, we decrease, we die to self, that you might live and increase in us. Speak to our hearts, Lord, like only you can as a father, and we will obey. We humble ourselves in your presence. We are honored to be seated with you. We love you with all our heart. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. It is interesting as we talk this morning from the context or the the topic of discipleship that Jesus begins and ends his ministry with this idea. Jesus launches his ministry around the idea that not only has he been called into the earth with a purpose, but Jesus does not have a desire to accomplish his purpose or his mission alone. We see Jesus in Mark 1, 16 to 18. He's already beginning to call disciples to himself. He is already beginning to draw people to himself that he might train them or teach them the ways of God. Jesus begins his ministry with creating disciples. Jesus ends his ministry with leaving on record for us as the church instructions to the church. We call it the Great Commission, but it is instructions to the church that just as Jesus has made disciples, uh, he calls the church to make disciples of all nations, that we are called to make, not only to be disciples, but to make disciples as children of Almighty God. The cost of discipleship. Before we can understand this idea of discipleship, it's really important that we understand what it means to actually be a disciple. 
What does it mean to be a disciple? If you go to the next slide, I have the word disciple defined for us this morning. The word disciple uh, is an avid learner, a diligent student, a submitted follower of their teacher. I'll say again, a disciple is an avid learner, a diligent student, and a submitted follower of their teacher. To be a disciple of Jesus means that we follow and long after Jesus above everything else. But but as Jesus mentions in our text, such discipleship will cost us something. We have to understand and recognize that to follow Jesus, to follow Christ's example, will require for us, for you and I, to to obey uh, God's commands, to obey the New Testament, to obey the ways of God, which is countercultural to the world that we live in. It is countercultural to how we live our lives today. So to be a disciple of Jesus Christ will cost us something. Jesus starts out the text, he starts out the text with pointing out the fact that, that as New Testament Christians, uh, that, that Jesus wanted to make us aware that as the Son of Man, as someone who is coming to pay the price for sin, that as the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things. Now, this is, this is good for us to recognize and understand that Jesus must suffer many things because then when you and I go through seasons of difficulty, seasons of suffering, we recognize that just as Christ suffered, that you and I are able to suffer for Christ's sake. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, it says, He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. That he must suffer many things and be rejected. You know, oftentimes as a pastor, as a counselor, you, don't, you, you, you would be surprised at how often I hear Christians come for counseling, come for some type of pastoral care. And one of the, one of the biggest root issues that many Christians have is they struggle with the idea of feeling rejected or fear of rejection. That, that rejection plays such a crippling role in the life of many Christians that many Christians struggle with trusting that God can love me unconditional, uh, that, that God can see my value and see my worth, that God can draw me out of darkness into his marvelous light, that God can have a plan for my life because God forbid sometimes the wounds of the past can handicap us so that we can't believe that just as as Jesus suffered, that I can suffer, and yet that suffering produce in me the purpose and plan of God. That sometimes a rejection by the world sets us up to accomplish what God desires for us to do in the kingdom. Jesus tells us that if they hated me, they will hate you. The cost of being a true disciple. I wish I could tell you and announce that when you give your life to Christ, that when you make a decision to follow him, that, that you, will, you will be hot on social media and everybody will love you and you will be, you will be a influencer and you will be, you, you will be uh, the, your favorite person on your job and you will be all of these grand things and everything will always go your way and you will never have hardship and you will never have... To, I wish I could tell you that, but Jesus tells us in the scriptures that in In this life, you will have trouble. He says, but take heart. I have already overcome the world. How many of you can can honestly say that even since 2022 started, you've had hardship? 
The idea of discipleship, that d- discipleship doesn't mean that, that everything always goes my way. That's, that's oftentimes why we as Christians struggle with our Christian faith, especially in Western culture, because, because in some ways we believe that following Jesus is like having a genie, and as long as I say in Jesus' name, Jesus has to give me everything I want. I came to announce to you that is not how salvation works. God is so much more concerned with your holiness than he is your happiness. He is much more concerned with you looking like Jesus than than he is with you looking like the world and acting like you belong in the church. He is much more concerned with your holiness. Jesus came into the earth that he might not just set you free from your sin. Jesus came into the earth that he might bring you into the family of God. That is that God's image might be manifested in you in such a way that now you look like Christ. You sound like Christ. There are three points I want to point out this morning uh, that the writer of Mark leaves on record for what it truly means to be a disciple, the cost of discipleship. And I'm not going to be up long, so I need you to take notes if you're taking notes because pastor going to keep going. All right. Point number one, point number one, the first point that the writer makes about what it means to follow Jesus, the cost of discipleship is you must deny yourself. You must deny yourself. Look at, look at verse 34. It says, then he called the crowd to himself along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. They must deny themselves. What does it mean to deny ourselves? It is to deny the sinful self, the ungodliness in us, worldly lust, and and that part that our old nature relates to as it relates to the world. Our Our former sinful companionships, and we are called by God to deny the things that make us disobedient to his will, to deny ourselves. It gives us the opportunity to take into account who our old nature is. Now, for many of us in this room, we this becomes a struggle. It becomes a difficulty. It is important for you and I to recognize the fact that when God challenges us to deny ourselves, to deny our old nature, it is for a purpose that God does so. How many of you would, would have recognized that your old nature gets you in trouble, more, probably more trouble than you're willing to admit? Your old nature gets you in trouble. My old nature gets me in trouble. I wish I could say that, that, that forgiveness is always easy. Sometimes when someone hurts you, forgiveness is difficult, but it's a decision you make. You, you forgive out of obedience. You don't forgive because you always feel like forgiving. We're going to act like we ain't going to, nobody want to say nothing right there. When was the last time you were hurt and you were like, oh, I'm so happy to forgive? Oh, Jesus, thank you. Right? No. You get hurt, especially when it's somebody that you care about. You get hurt, and the wound lays there, and you know God is challenging you to forgive. You know God is wrestling with you to let it go. You know God is, is charging you to love that person. You know, you, know you, you go do your morning Devo, and, you, and you, you're like, God, speak to me. God, speak to me. Speak, speak to me, Tord. And then, and then it says, uh, turn the other cheek. You're like, that wasn't the Lord. That was not the Lord. Okay, Lord, you know, speak to me, G. That was not you, Jesus. 
this responsibility we have to take inventory of our human nature and to lay on the altar all that that our will, our desire, our emotions, our our psychological framing, all of those things, we have to be willing to bring those things to Jesus. That is one of the reasons why, let me announce to you, that is one of the reasons why we talk about putting on the whole armor of God. The, one of the things that God wants to control is your mind. Why do you think God gives you a helmet of salvation? The helmet of salvation is not just to keep the enemy out, it's to regulate the you that's in there. The helmet of salvation gives you the mind of Christ. It gives you the perspective of God. So when God tells us to put on the helmet of salvation, it's not just to keep us from the attacks of the enemy. It's to regulate your, because some of us, let's be honest, we got messed up mentalities. I ain't going to get into that. We ain't got time. I'm going to keep going, Lord. We ain't got time for that. How does denying oneself show up in our everyday lives? Denying oneself is denying the sinful self as we see expounded by Peter. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 through 12. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse 11 through 12. This abstaining from fleshly lust abstaining from fleshly lust. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11 through 12 says, Dear friends, I warn you. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very soul. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. This idea in 1 Peter chapter 2 is that because we recognize that the world is not our home, we have a responsibility to abstain. We have a responsibility to keep our life right before the Lord, to live properly. To live properly. 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse 1 through 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 1 through 4, no longer living like the rest of the world. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 4 says, So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You have had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immortality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties and their terrible worship of idols. That you no longer desire to live your life like the rest of the world. Now, for many of us as Christians, we have a responsibility. I used to have a, a pastor, an old pastor, that, he, that used to tell me, he said, for, for some Christians, their heart is saved, just their mouth isn't saved. You know, they, your heart saved. You know, it's like, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. But as soon as something happens, you cussing people out, you, you throwing people to bird on the freeway because you got road rage and... Sometimes you have to stop and just say, Lord, save my mouth, save my mind. Let my mind catch up with my heart. Let my speech catch up with my heart. Sometimes you have to be willing to surrender your your language to the Lord. And you know what the wisest thing I've ever learned as a Christian? I'm going to share with you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This will save your life as a Christian. The Bible says that Jesus was led as a lamb before the shears, yet he opened not his mouth. The best thing you can do is keep your mouth. You in a mar- for married people, I don't want to have no counseling. Well, I'm going to give you all the cruel right now. When you get in a heated discussion, stop talking. 
The wor- you know how much counseling I do as a pastor to Christian marriages who the husband's like, you just like your mama. That's, that's, like, that's fighting words right there. It's like it's, it's all over. You just like your daddy. This idea that, that when things happen, the wisest thing we can do is to deny our flesh. It's to recognize that God is in control. We also see this manifested, how we deny ourselves, as Apostle Paul describes. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter number 3, uh, verse 4 through 6. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6. It says, though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have more. I was circumcised when I was eight years old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel, and I am a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there was ever one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. And then we have Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 14. It says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else, <clears throat> everything else is worthless. Can I get some water? When compared with the <clears throat> infinite value of knowing Christ, Jesus, my Lord, for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness. Listen to this. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. Thank you. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. This idea that we do not have our own righteousness That when we consider what it means to deny ourselves, when we consider what it means to live a life of denying ourselves, when was the last time you gave up something you wanted for something you knew God wanted? When was the last time you made a decision to turn the TV off and instead open your Bible? When was the last time you turned Netflix or Hulu or whatever you watch off and instead you spent time in prayer? When was the last time you canceled something you were going to do to instead go to something you knew you needed to do spiritually? I'll wait while you think. When was the last time you put what you wanted on the altar? You sacrificed your will because you cared more about what God wanted than you did about what you wanted. And let me announce to you, you know, and I say this lovingly with all my heart, you know, if God always sounds like you, you're not denying yourself. I just feel like the Lord wants me to go to the mall and get me a new dress. It's like, well, oh, no. It's like God God brought that Macy's sales across my path. He, he was calling me to, like, mm. I think you would have went to that sale whether the Lord was calling you or not. A true sign that you are denying yourself is when you obey God even when you don't want to. That you you count the cost, that you hold to God. When you know God is calling you into something, you know God is calling you deeper. You know God is calling you into a deeper place of worship, a deeper place of prayer. When was the last time you were okay with being uncomfortable because you knew being uncomfortable was exactly what God was calling you to? When was the last time you were willing to obey God at all cost, denying yourself? 
This is very difficult. This is a difficult message because our Western culture is like, oh, God doesn't want you to do that. God would never ask you to do something. Well, if God wanted you to do that, he would give you the desire to do it. That's not always the case. There are plenty of things that this scripture, the scriptures tell me I'm supposed to do that I don't always have a desire to do. But out of obedience, I make a conscious decision to do. That, that is what it means for your desires to change. When, when the Bible says that, that, our, that our old nature is done away with and that our old man is crucified with Christ, it means that, that if you allow God, God will give you new desires, but you have to be willing to allow him to do it. The first point is denying oneself. Verse 34, it says then, Take up your cross. Now, think about this for a moment. We, we talk about this passage all the time. We got denying yourself. Now we're talking about taking up your cross. What does taking up your cross mean? Taking up your cross re- refers to you and I being willing to sacrifice for him. We have to be willing to sacrifice for him. Every, every time we serve, we sacrifice. Every time you give your gifts and your talents to the Lord, you sacrifice. Every time you give financially, you sacrifice. But those are not the only ways that you sacrifice. I I tell you all the time, you know, do you sacrifice time? How many married couples do we have in? How many people in here are married? All right. Thank you, Eric, for emphasizing happily. (laughs) You're married. Raise your hand again. Married. Think about it for a moment. You know, whenever we talk about taking up our cross, a lot of times we will refer to spending time with the Lord. But spending time with the Lord should not be your cross. I'm going to say that again. Your time with the Lord should be joyous. Could, could you imagine being married and, you're, and your husband's like, I'm going to take up my cross. We're going to do a date night. It's like, I'm your cross? It's like, does that sound loving? Spending time with your spouse should be joyous. It should be like, oh, I love, oh, we got a chance to just, we, you know, we got a babysitter and we got a chance just to reconnect. We laughed, we had fun because that, it reminds you that that person is your best friend. That's how your time in the presence of the Lord should be. So, so whenever we say, oh, take up your cross, spend time in the word, spend time in prayer, take up your cross. I hear to announce to you that, that if, if spending time with God is a cross, you need to ask yourself whether you actually have relationship. Because for, for, for those of us who know God, I can tell you there is nothing in the world that compares to knowing him. There is nothing in the world that compares to being in relationship with him. I love spending time with the Lord. I got up this morning, Violet and Salma are in the living room. They're they're eating breakfast, and I'm getting getting ready because I come earlier than than they do. I come to the church, and, and I'm in the room, and I'm getting dressed, and I'm singing worship to God. Not because I got to do a message, but just because I love to spend time with him. I came in here during the week, and I just spent time with him. Whenever I'm in my car, I spend time with him. I actually like, some of y'all don't like riding by yourself. I love riding by myself because it is the best time I get. Y'all afraid of quietness? Some people are afraid, oh, it's just too quiet in the car. That's because you, you've forgotten that you have an audience with the one who can change anything. You have an audience with heaven. You have an audience with God. So I got up this morning and, you know, Violet and them are doing their thing and they're, they're going, and I'm in the room and I'm just, I'm just with the Lord and I'm in his presence and I'm spending time with him. And one of the most powerful things that you can do is to recognize that God is not your cross. Now, there are things in life that God requires of you to make your cross that you have to be willing to sacrifice. But as long as you are, as long as this is right, your cross is easy. Because nothing compares. If if you're struggling with your cross, you have not fully accepted how much God loves you.
when you fully understand the magnitude of his love, nothing else, everything else becomes. Why would you think about it for a moment? If someone gave you the greatest gift in the world, and then someone else tried to lead you away and gave you something of lesser value, why would you leave that which is great for something that is lesser? When we recognize that there's nothing greater than Jesus, that there's nothing more important than Jesus, then we are able to keep in perspective all of the things that the world comes to offer us, all of the things that the world brings to our attention. What does does it mean to take up your cross? It means to voluntarily and decisively make the decision to follow God and to follow God's rule and command above our pain, our shame, and our persecution. It is to voluntarily and decisively follow God's command above our pain, our shame, and our persecution. To voluntarily and decisively follow him. For some of you in this room, your cross may be alcohol. That God wants you to put it on the altar and sacrifice it. Because every time you consume it, you get in a situation where you misrepresent him. For some of you in this room, it might, it might be shopping. Because maybe that's a temptation and a lust for you. You got your family in debt and you're struggling. And yet every time a sale comes, you're in line with your credit card. Maybe the Lord is asking you to put that on the altar. For some of you in the room, it's not external. It's internal. Sometimes it's your ego. It's your pride. I wish I could tell you, I wish I could tell you how often we as Christians we, 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 we attack the stuff externally because we can see everybody's stuff externally. Oh, yeah, I see you. I see that. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. But what about the sin of the heart? What about the stuff in your heart that God needs to deal with? I'm going to leave that alone, Jesus. I'm not going. Everybody's quiet, Lord, this morning. I'm stepping on toes. I'm stepping on toes. How does, how does the manifestation of the cross show up for us? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9. It reads, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ. But you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. And to this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags, we are brutally treated, we are homeless. We work hard with our own hands, we are cursed. We, we, when we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. When we become the scum of the earth and the garbage of the world, upright before all, we respond accordingly. This idea that because we are his, we, even though we are persecuted, we respond in the right way. Even though we are slandered, we respond in kindness. Even though this is what taking up your cross, I wish I could tell you how often I have to re remind Christians of what it means to take up your cross. It means that we don't have the right to defend ourselves. The Bible tells us that vengeance is mine, I will repay. You know how often I have to remind myself that when someone slaps me to turn the other cheek? That when someone wrongs me, I don't have the right to vindicate myself. That is my cross. If someone talks bad about me, I am, I am commanded by God to love them. That's not going to get no amen. When, when I'm mistreated, I'm commanded by God to still treat them right. 
When someone does me wrong, I am commanded by God to bless them. Why? Because that is what it means to take up my cross. It is, be- it is recognizing the fact that because of everything Christ has done for me, that the least I can do is to take something on his behalf. That, that because I did him wrong that, and he still loved me and he died for me and he, he forgave all my sin, that if he can do that when I was not thinking about him, the least I can do is take something for somebody else. That is the least I can do. That is my cross. I don't hold grudges. I don't get offended. I choose to forgive. I choose to let it go because he forgave me first. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That when you and I were not thinking about God, all he was doing was thinking about us. We are responsible. We are responsible to take up our cross, to to be intentional about what it means to carry our cross. My last and final point. We have to follow. We must follow. Jesus. And I almost added this word. We must follow Jesus' example. You will not be responsible. You are not responsible to follow me and my example because I'm flawed. Pastor makes mistakes. I fall short. But you are responsible to follow his example. Jesus is the only perfect shepherd. He is the only perfect shepherd. The writer of Mark leaves on record for his listeners in verse 34. He ends verse 34 by saying, and follow me. My question to you this morning, because believe it or not, all of us are following something or somebody. My question to you this morning is, are you following his example? Are you following Christ's example of what it means to live a life in the earth, fully surrendered to God? Or are you allowing your life to be consumed and and influenced by the world around you? Are you allowing your life? I had a situation this week on my job. True story. Had a situation this week on my job that I had a difficult situation and I had a leader come and was saying all this stuff to me, pretty rude. And I remember wanting, I felt the urge to defend myself. I felt the urge to, you know, ask God to rain down judgment and, you know, God, you need to come to my defense and all this stuff. And I remember just feeling angry and struggling and wanting to fight for my name and fight for all this stuff. And when I got ready for the meeting, it was like a few minutes before the meeting, and I was like, you know, I need to pray. And I prayed. And God took me to the passage where Jesus, the Bible says that he was led as a lamb before the shears, yet he opened not his mouth. So when I got in that meeting and all these things were said, all these things were said, all these things were said, I just, I understand. I understand. And my boss was like, you're not going to answer to this. You're not going to say anything. You're not going to defend. No, because at the end of the day, I am not on my job because of me. I'm on my job by assignment by God. And because I'm there by his grace to accomplish his mission based on his will, I surrender it all to him. For some of you in this room, you've been wrestling with a relationship that you feel like you need to fight You've been wrestling with a relationship that you feel like you need to vindicate. You may have even been praying and asking the Lord to vindicate. 
You may have been asking the Lord to, to clear your name, or maybe you, you felt the struggle to want to prove someone wrong. If you're a disciple, if your life is hid in Christ, if you belong to him, then your life is not your own. Your reputation is not your own. None of us have the right to fight for what is not ours. You belong to him. Your character belongs to him. Your life belongs to him. Your name, your identity, all that you are, if you, are, if you have given your life to Christ, all that you are belongs to him. This is not, this is not a, a, an, about us. This is not about you. This is not about you proving that you are right. This is not about you proving anything. This is about you recognizing that no matter what anybody else says, the only thing that matters is what God says. And being confident in the fact that what the Father says about you is good that what the Father says about you is true, that what the Father says about you is worth it in the end. We don't live our lives to impress people. We live our lives to obey the one who can give us influence with anyone. And with that, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. We have a responsibility to follow his example to live our lives in such a way that it reflects the character and nature and identity of Christ. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I want to pray for you this morning. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I understand that following Jesus will cost me something. I understand that following Jesus means that I will have to deny myself and take up my cross. But pastor, it has been hard. And the things I've been going through have made recently have made it difficult. No matter what it is you've been going through. If that's you, I want to pray for you this morning. If you would say that pastor, what I've been going through recently, it has been difficult to be willing to deny myself and follow. If that's you, and I already see hands starting to be lifted. If that's you, I want you to lift your hands to the Lord. I see your hands. I see your hands. Just, Pastor, it's been difficult. Keep your hands lifted. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I honestly am not sure that I even, I even know the Lord as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to know him. I want to be an intimate, personal relationship with him, but I'm not sure if I actually know him like this, where I can deny myself. I can live for him. I have not accepted him personally. That's you. You're enjoying those with their hands lifted by lifting your hand. Just add your hand to theirs. I see, I see the hand. Whether it's first time or recommitment. Following Jesus will cost you something. And my last petition is Pastor, I've gone through something really difficult. I love the Lord. I'm his. I know I'm his. But I just need prayer. Prayer to stay focused. 
prayer to be encouraged, prayer to trust his promises, prayer to know that he is with me even when sometimes I don't feel it. And if that is you this morning, if that is you, I'm going to ask that you join us with your hands lifted. Just I know him, I know him, but Pastor, I just want to stay focused. I just want to keep my eyes on him. Father, you see every hand. You know every situation. You know every circumstance. Father, you know why you drew them into this place. You knew in what, for what purpose. You know what it is you are calling them to let go of. You know what it is you're calling them to embrace. Father, you know what it is that you desire to do in their heart and in their life. God, this morning I ask, just as your word says, that you would complete the work you have begun, that you would complete that work in their heart, you would complete the work in their faith, that you would finish the work. God, we pray for those who would say, I don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, but I desire to know him. I want to love him. I want to have the forgiveness of sin. I want, I want to live a life obedient to him. For those individuals, Lord, let this moment be a moment that their heart becomes open to you, that their life becomes surrendered to you, and that your Holy Spirit would step into their heart. It would step into their life and begin to change and to transform them. Father, we pray this morning that for every person who's struggling, struggling to keep their focus, struggling to keep their eyes on you this morning, God, we pray that you would fix their eyes and fix their heart on you. That, God, you would so illuminate their mindset, you would illuminate, Father, their perspective, you would illuminate their life. Father, I pray this week would be a week that your Holy Spirit speaks to them. Maybe while they're watching TV to give an hour of that TV time to time in your word. Whether it's something else that they're giving time to, that God, that there would be this tug in their heart to lay something down that they may benefit by giving something greater back to you. Father, we ask for those who are in the room who need healing. God, we pray for healing this morning. Healing from rejection. Healing, Lord, from, from just past sins. Healing, physical healing, Lord. We pray that you touch bodies this morning. We pray that you touch emotions this morning. You touch mindsets this morning. Father, we lay everything. The cross comes to break us and set us free from everything. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your spirit. We thank you for your love. We thank you for freedom in Christ Jesus. And, Father, for that this morning, we rejoice. We are honored. We love you. We thank you, and we celebrate you. In Jesus' precious and holy name. And all of God's people said amen and amen. I want to challenge you this morning, challenge you before you leave, to look for opportunities this week to give something away so that you can give that time to the Lord. That is what denying yourself. In the car, maybe instead of listening to the music you would normally listen to, Put on worship. Give that car time to the Lord. It might be hard for you to give up your favorite show this week, but look for something you can give up and give that time to the Lord. I promise you, 
It'll change your life like you would not imagine. When you're willing to lay aside what you want to embrace and celebrate what God wants for you. Amen. And with that, uh, we're going to have Sister Karen come forward with announcements. And so let's put our hands together for Karen. You may be seated. Pastor, thank you for that encouragement. Can't believe it's already May 1st, huh? Looks Seems like we just started 2022. But uh, we have a few events um, coming up this month. So who came last night? Ladies. Oh, Eric, no, yeah. Amen. How was it with Dr. Camille? Good? Good. Well, women, it's not over yet. We'd like to invite you back next Sunday. It is Women's Day. So we have a guest, Tamika Brown. So visitors, please come out and join us. Um, Men, I guarantee there's something in it for you too. So we invite everyone back next Sunday. Um, Later in the month, we have a family movie night. On Friday the 20th, it'll be a potluck. So come join us then. Um, Once again, we'd like to thank our family, friends, our visitors for joining us today. We are truly humbled and grateful for choosing LOCF um, for your home church this morning. So again, we'd like to invite you back next Sunday. Um, Before you leave, please meet a new friend um, and have a good week. Bye. (laughs) 